Hi guys, guess what? Thank you very much again for joining us on Sifu Wild at Costco's podcast or live podcast. And eventually, you know, it will be the recording on YouTube. Again, this is beyond kicking and punching because, you know, after you get your black belt or even whatever way you start, okay, there's more to it than just kicking and punching. There's inspiration, there's uh, motivation, there is so much more to just the physical aspect. So again, thank you for joining. And if you do have any questions, by all means, uh, write it in the chat box. Also, if you're listening in on the replay for this for YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, like, and hit that bell button so that you get notified for every new episode that he puts up or any other video that might actually help you get better and do better in whatever you do because Sifu Aldacascos is the how I would call the professional maximizer and again he will actually have products on the CoscosMartialArts.com where he's gonna be where he's selling his old videos as well as new and upcoming uh programs which i would highly highly recommend because you know if you want to be the best you have to train with the best so again let's hear it for sifu aldacascos thank you sifu the floor is yours all right well the floor over here is pretty nice we got nice weather Hey, everybody, welcome to all the show Beyond Kicking and Punching, okay? And, you know, when we talk about Beyond Kicking and Punching, we all go to a limit where we reach a peak, whether it's going to be physically, emotional, spiritually, whatever, there's always something more to do. You know, for a lot of us, after getting black belt, most of the people would think, well, and we've had some of this, and I'm sure a lot of you have had this if you have a school, that once a person becomes a black belt, you don't see them too much in class anymore because they have to limit themselves. And that's not it. A black belt is only just the key to opening up the door for something more of uh, more in the future. And that brings me to Ron Lu. Ron Lu was Ron Lu. But then he became a Sifu and then a grandmaster and a senior grandmaster. Now, how did Ron Lu get there? that's going beyond kicking and punching. So for me, it's very interesting because with this individual, we grew up together in San Leandro, California, Hillwood, California with Malia and a lot of the top guys we have there. And it was pretty much like a group. And if anybody knows about the group that came up under our umbrella, they all went out to different areas and became somebody. It's, it's because of going beyond kicking and punching. So here now we have senior, oh my, senior grandmaster Ron Lu, and we have a lot of history. And we're gonna be talking about the history, about where he came from. And you know, you're gonna see some pictures of us as being little skinny little guys in our 20s to guys that have no hair on our head anymore. <laughs> so let's let's have and everybody give a real good welcome. I like to hear it if you can. And let's give a good welcome to Grandmaster Ron Lu. Hello. 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 That is a real short clip of uh, Super Ron Lu. Of course, he's up in the front and I'm in the back. I'm trying to hide behind of him. But uh, anyway. Okay, Sifu Ron, you don't mind, I just call you Sifu Ron because I remember you more as Sifu Ron. Sometimes I just call you Ronnie. Guys, if you can see, you see Sifu Ron Lu, where is he? All right, I'm gonna welcome him on because he's wearing a hat, okay? I, I'm, I'm wearing my hat because I just wanna honor him, but he's wearing a hat for other reasons <laughs> because he needs to cover up what's not there. <laughs> All right. Okay, Ron, 
let's get let's get back into you now, okay? I mean, we've we've known each other for, geez, centuries, I would say. Let's let's say, how exactly did we actually meet? Well, this, I'll, uh, let me talk about the picture, and then I'll talk about that. Yeah, hold that picture, yeah, honey. Yeah, yeah. Put that picture back up if you can. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. There we go. So this was interesting. This was staged by Al. And uh, Al said, to, hey, uh, have you have a picture of yourself uh, doing some martial art kung fu stuff? I said, no. So, well, let me set you up. So that's Dennis Tour Masi on the, on the left. And the one who's leaning on, the, on his back, that's Mel Lee, who introduced me to you, Al. I'll get back to that later. And the way this pose is, uh, how am I going to do this? You know, without, and my dad took a Polaroid picture of this. So I put my, my foot on Dennis to hold me up. I have Mel on my knee, you know, my thigh, holding him up. And Al, you know, is holding me up so I don't fall. And my dad <laughs> would go hurry and take that picture. So that's how the picture was taken. And by the way, all those black uniforms, a Kung Fu uniform, my mom made that for us. Yeah, and the hard part of making that uh, Kung Fu uniform was the frog knot. The frog knot was the hardest thing to make. So that's how it came up. Well, Al, how we met is that Mel, Mel Lee worked with you at uh, Western, right? Western Electric? Right. Where you Correct. And so Mel and I uh, were good friends. And uh, he said, you got to meet this uh, you know, Sifu who does uh, Kempo, Chinese Kempo. So really, he said, I don't know anything about that. At that time, I was uh, taken from Pauline. And I told Pauline, well, I'm going to visit this Kempo master uh, and and just see what it is, but I don't want to change kung fu. I'll, I'll just stay with kung fu. So I met you at your house because Mel brought me to your house, and Mass introduced you. And then he said, "Yeah, I got a school when he comes." And so I went to your school, you know, and with Mel. And uh, the first thing you asked me is that uh, you take kung fu. Yeah, uh, do you spar? I said, what's spar? I don't know anything about sparring. And they said, well, uh, sparring is like fighting. Yeah. And so you said, well, why don't you spar with me? I think you had a brown belt. Is that Mel uh, Albro? Yeah, Mel. I was in the So uh, Mel, Mel, I said, I don't know anything about sparring. You know? So here, Mel spar with me. And then uh, I just, I don't know anything about sparring. So I just kind of block, block, block. And he looked and he said, Who's your Kung Fu master? He said, Pauline. I said, I'd like to meet him. Yeah. So that's how we met. Yeah, and that's how you met Sifu Pauline. What year was that? That was early 60s. So uh, I started with Paul in 63. So you probably came over about mid 60s. Yeah. Oh. And uh, that's where you started getting interested in Kung Fu. And that's where you, you learned from Sifu Paul because we went to uh, had a school at a, a, a Japanese uh, hall. Uh, had a movie theater some, on Sunday. So you came and, and joined us. And then later on, when Paul got drafted uh, in the Army, uh, and the reason he got drafted, because he came from New York to California and didn't let them know that he moved, and they were looking for him. And they, he got a letter and call, says, go to Oakland. He got drafted to go to Vietnam. And that's when uh, Sifu Paul said, why well, don't you go see uh, Wong Chuck Man? Yes. That's how we got what was, in, what was interesting was just that when I came up to uh, California, I came up with Kaju Kimbo, and I came up with Silam Pai and Honga from Bak Sam Kong in Hawaii. That was totally Southern style. <clears throat> and what interests me was that uh, what I saw what you're doing was a Northern style, and that was missing in my arsenal of weapons, and I needed to have that northern style because it impressed me because the southern style was you know how it is low harsh stances no high kicks and all of this but when you demonstrated or watching uh Bach, uh i mean uh, paul ing it was very interesting because i never saw the swifts before i never saw the silum kicks i never saw aerials before and i needed that and ron thank you because i tell you what man it just put two and two together to make five with the four. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, that was interesting. I want to just go back a little bit because uh, you had told me that your family has a history 
going way back. Um, yeah. And tell me about the history on how your family actually was very prominent, from what I understand, back in China and eventually came to the United States. Well, this is uh, uh, Master uh, uh, Yao and Miss, uh, his wife, uh, Mrs. Yao, and that's about energy. I'll talk about that later on. But the history goes back to that. My uncle Peter uh, traced back uh, our lineage, and he found out that I'm 172 generation. 172. He said, wow. And it goes back to the dynasty of, uh, you know, way back when uh, Yellow Emperor was part of our dynasty. And so uh, my great, 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 great grandfather, way back when, uh, he was a mason, you know, mason and putting the stones and everything else. So uh, Uncle Peter uh, went back to China and traced back uh, where my great, great grandfather was. And uh, that house still exists. In fact, uh, it still have dirt uh, floor and stones, uh, uh, you know, stove type of thing, stone, and also a well is in the center of the village, you know, and, the, and so that's still there. So the history really goes back, uh, like I'm back uh, 172 generations. The interesting thing is that uh, my great grandfather came through, uh, through Angel Island. And uh, when they come through the Angel Island, they, uh, they have the interrogation and everything else. And one of the things that uh, the generation that came in uh, as that, uh, they were considered as the uh, silent generation, uh, meaning that if they said anything uh, that was different uh, between each other, the, the, you know, the husband and wife, uh, they get deported. They go back to, uh, back to China. And so uh, uh, luckily you know, they got to go through the, you know, the so forth and coming back in. So that was good. So, uh, eight, uh, eight generations of uh, Lu. They changed the name Lu uh, from L-I-U to L-E-W when it got to Angel Island, I guess because of different uh, spelling. So anyone who came L-E-W actually came in actually uh, from Angel Island or from New York side, they changed the name to, uh, or the spelling, L-E-W. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wow. That's interesting. And then um, when you family just got here. What year was that when they arrived here in America? Yeah, well, great-grandfather was, uh, uh, he was born 1880-something, so he came to the United States about 1918, no, actually earlier, about 1908, and my dad was born in uh, 1918, and uh, so that's, that's an interesting story. So they came in, and uh, actually my dad was born in San Francisco, and I was born in San Francisco and uh, 1944. Uh, so it, it's been an uh, interesting journey, you know, for them and for me. Mm, interesting. Did you do any martial arts when, were you, when you were younger prior to Hoang? Nothing. In fact, I, I was introduced to Kung Fu by my cousin, Stephen Lum. And uh, he would come over in the summertime and uh, stay uh, with us. And one time he came and said, hey, I'm, I'm taking, uh, I'm learning Kung Fu. And I said, is that a Chinese food? What, what is that? He said, no, that's our, our heritage you know, of Kung Fu. And so he did some things with me and, and uh, taught me some moves and I got interested. And so this is back in uh, 63, yeah, 1963. And actually early about 60. And then I started searching for a Kung Fu master and everyone would tell him to go back to San Francisco. Here's Paul Ying on the left, Kim Yun and Raymond Wong, and they formed the uh, Thai Mantis uh, Association. And actually all three of them were learning from Wong Jack Man. And so I began to search for a master you know, and, and uh, couldn't find anybody. And two, I went to a restaurant with Dennis Putamasi and we had a Chinese restaurant. And uh, we saw this uh, one waiter and he was waiting on tables and the, how he arranged his teacups and everything else. And I, and I nudge, uh, you know, Dennis said, hey, he knows Kung Fu. And he said, how do you know? Well, from you. you know? So uh, he waited on us and uh, by the way, uh, you know uh, uh, anybody who teach Kung Fu? He said, yeah, yeah San Francisco. He said, no, that, yeah, we heard that. That's too far. He said, do you know any Kung Fu? And he said, no. <laughs> He, he knows something. We ate lunch, dinner for the next three months. You know? And finally, he got used to us. He said, are you sure? 
Yeah, that's Wong Jack Man. Okay. So are you sure that uh, you don't know any Kung Fu? And I said, at that time, Paul, being a master coming from New York, he would actually travel from uh, Sunnyvale, and that's where he lived, with Kem Yun. And he would travel to San Francisco to learn uh, under Wong Jack Man, even though he's a master. And so him and Wong Jack Man, you know, became very good friends. And, uh, and that's where Paul picked up Northern style, but also, you know, Chun Fa, Tai Chi and so forth. But he wanted to just uh, expand his knowledge in uh, uh, Northern style. So that's what you learned from Northern style from Paul, because Paul learned from Wong Jack Man, the Northern style. Raymond Wong was there and Kim Yun was there. And uh, so that's how I began to, uh, to pick up, you know, from Paul. Yeah. You know what is interesting? It's just that you have the picture there of uh, Cam Yuen. And a lot of people don't know that during that time, they were also producing the, the television, television series Kung Fu, on mm -hmm. which Cam Yuen, who's in the middle, was actually helping, uh, I, I think it's David Chow on no, the series as a, as a stunt and Kung Fu coordinator, as, yeah. I, as I recall. And well, naturally now, you know, the Kung Fu series has been taken over and now there's a woman that's playing the new Kung Fu series, correct? Okay, yeah. I, I think yeah. I think you told me about that. And, um, you know, it was interesting and during this time, hardly anyone outside of the Chinese community knew what Kung Fu was in the United States. Matter of fact, when the word Kung Fu came out, um, some people were spelling it with G-U-N-G-F-U instead of K-U-N-G-F-U. So let me clarify that to some of you guys, that when you hear the word Kung Fu, it can be heard many different ways. Kung Fu, Kung Fu, Hu Hu, I don't know. But <laughs> when, when the original Kung Fu in, in what we had in Oakland, California, we spelled it with the G U N G, Kung Fu, and we began to switch the G U N G Kung Fu to K U N G because it was very, becoming very popular with the Kung Fu series, and also the G U N G. When people hear that, it's more associated to the Cantonese instead of the Mandarin, and because Kung Fu that came out was associated more to the Northern style and because of Wong Jack Man and the Kung Fu series, naturally it was much more easier for us to use K-U-N-G. So the, I just want to just clear that, clarify that up because a lot of you guys in the martial arts maybe don't know the history on how Kung Fu actually came into, to, uh, into the United States, but it actually came about a, a century before when the Chinese workers were uh, came over to work on the railroad in many many different places so you know there's been a history of kung fu in the united states way long before um the western or white uh, 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 western civilization begin to knew uh, know of it because they didn't really become popular in the united states until the late 1960s when, when you had Jerry carradine bruce lee and you know wong jack man and and you know people that done it interesting enough that when we started in learning with Wong Jack man um Malia and I used to go and travel I don't know what street that was what do you know what what street uh Wong Wong Jack man school was at Pacific Pacific 880 right right yeah and it was really great uh, uh yeah I uh, yeah okay that I mean we had a lot of good fun there and um uh Malia learned really good, and I think I think um, she can later on. We can talk about that you know, where, where Wong Jack Man taught, taught her the sword, and that was really fascinating. And this when 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 the broadsword begin to start getting introduced into it. Anyway, getting back to you, Ron. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about really broad things because there's so much success and failure within the within the martial arts. People get kicked and punched, and they begin to just phase out. While you were learning Kung Fu, what was your worst fear? Worst fear is learning the chain whip. That was the worst fear of learning that, you know. And, uh, 
uh, if I can learn it, buddy, you got to hit a lot. And uh, but uh, with that, you know, that actually gravitated for me to learn the uh, bullwhip. Uh, later on, we'll talk about that. But my worst fear is worrying, you know, learning to work with that, and that was painful. And but I love the uh, open hand forms. And uh, you see, for uh, Paul started teaching me the Hunga style, which became my favorite. Uh, so that's the tiger crane style. And uh, and with his style of the tiger crane, I took a liking to that. So I learned the northern, but I kind of gravitated to more the Hunga style the weapon of the, the chain. But all the others like the sword, you know, and the other things. Yeah. Hello there. <laughs> um, one of the favorite forms I know that you like to do was fufu and fuha. Can you explain that? Well, Fuk Fu is the call of Chantanese Tiger, and that's when I learned first, but my favorite was the uh, Tiger and Crane, was Fu Hawk. So anyway, uh, the story goes that uh, uh, that was my favorite, is 150 moves. And uh, that was the longest one, but the way uh, Sifu Ao uh, learned, I have to tell you the story, because I remember you called me up, and that's when you were going to Colorado, okay? And when you were in Colorado, you called me up, said, hey, Ron, uh, I'm going to go to Colorado, but I want to drop by. I want to learn uh, uh, Fu Hawk from you. I said, OK, how many uh, weeks are you going to spend in San Jose? He said, uh, I only got two hours. I said, in two hours? He said, you want to learn uh, 150 moves in two hours? And I said, yeah, I, I, I got a good memory. And uh, my Leia, uh, my wife, she take good notes. And I said, oh, okay. So you came by, yeah, driving a Malaya's Porsche and a green Porsche, I remember, Forest Green Porsche. And then uh, I said, okay, you want to learn 150 moves? Yeah. So, okay, we started, and then Malay would take notes. And then, and after two hours, you learned 150 moves. And he said, I was surprised. I said, wow, you got a good memory. Yeah. And so that's when he said, okay, uh, goodbye, I'm done. And that's how you learn uh, Fu Hawk. And by the way, when you uh, did the Wen Hop Kun Do group over there, I was listed as number 10, the oh. 10th uh, of Fu Hawk. Uh, uh, Fu, yeah, Fu Hawk with the Tiger Cream, five animals. Yeah. And oh. so that became very, very signature of, uh, of what I do. And uh, sorry to hear that you don't have that on number 10 anymore. I guess, you know, people forgot. No. So that was my favorite. Yeah. It's, it's a really long form and it, it takes a long time for most people to learn it. So, you know, it's in some of the schools it's in and some of it is phased out. Yeah, it really depends. Okay, any near, did you have any kind of near death experience? No. Have you ever used the martial arts? No. Out in the street? No. That's pretty good because most people, most people somewhere along their life. Well, there's a reason I'm happy because I have Ted Sotelo with me and anybody want to fight me, I just turn, uh, fight that guy. And you fight that guy, you get past him, you get, you get to fight me. I never had to fight, you know, because uh, I have people around me that knew more than I did. <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't know Ted Sotelo. Maybe you can explain. Well, Ted, Ted and I actually met Ted at the same time I met you, but he was one of your favorite students and one of your best students. And uh, so that was back in 63. There's Ted on the left, you know, rest in peace, Ted. You know, I love that guy. And uh, he, he came and saw me because uh, he was doing boxing. So 1974, I just opened my school and Ted just came by maybe 75. He was taking boxing, doing boxing, down the street from me on 10th Street, because my school was on 8th and Henning. On 10th and, uh, and Henning was a boxing school, and he was doing boxing. And so on the way uh, out, going back home, he saw my sign, and he said, oh, Kung Fu School. And he popped in, and he saw me, he said, hey, that's Ron. He said, hey, Ron, you remember me? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, Teddy. Man, I haven't seen you since about 64, 65. Well, ever since then, uh, Teddy said, well, you got an extra room here because I got two rooms and then one's empty. He said, can I train here? You got bags and everything else. I said, yeah, you can train here. And so Ted started training at, at my school and they started bringing uh, uh, you know, his friends, uh, Wally uh, Estropia and uh, Junior Cotteverio 
and uh, uh, those guys were you know like really close friends and you know fighting guys and so uh, so that's how that started with Ted you know start training with them so that's how I got hooked up with Ted. It's funny a lot of my students ended up with your group um, and I see Kakoi Kanidis picture in the back of you can you explain the affiliation with uh, Grandmaster Kokoi Kanete. Well, you know, Kokoi Kanete is one of a kind. You know, he uh, passed away at the age of uh, uh, 91. And uh, I met him by accident because when I was working at FMC, you know, as a program manager, uh, I was introduced to him by another fellow uh, employee and he uh, knew martial arts. And he said, I, I met this master and got this master training with him and he does a screamer. And uh, I said, really? So I don't know anything about a screamer. And so uh, one afternoon, I had lunch with him. Uh, great man, uh, tell a lot of jokes. And, uh, he took a liking to me, I took a liking to him. So I start uh, training with him. And when I trained with him, I said, wow, I like him. He has hands, except he has a stick, a lissy in his hand, the right hand, an open left hand. And he said, I like that. Yeah. So I call up Ted. Say, and Ted was training at my school. He said, Ted, I met this master, you know, Kukoi Kinyente, you know, from the Philippines. He said, oh, really? Well, by the way, I, I, I called Junior Cucaberto. And I said, Junior, I met this master. And, and I forgot Kukoi's name at that time, you know. And I said, uh, Junior, I met this master, you know, from uh, the Philippines. And well, what's his name? I can't remember. Uh, where's he from? Uh, Philippines. Uh, starts with a C. Uh, Cebu? Yeah, yeah, Cebu. Uh, can you remember his name? It starts with a C. Is it Kakoi Kenyete? Yeah. So well, I'm learning from him. Later on, long story short, he came to my school because uh, he couldn't uh, train anymore in another place. So he was at my school. And uh, Ted, you know, got introduced to him and we started training with him. And then we told Junior, say, hey, Junior, you know, you got to come. Kakoi is at Ron's school. Yeah, and there's 15 of us uh, at Ron's school, and, and Junior said, I don't want to come. So why? Is it uh, he'll have me teach? Because he was Junior was going uh, to Cebu in 1984 and learning from Kukoi, and he said, I, I will just you know be teaching people. I don't want to teach anyone, you know. And then Ted said to Junior, said, uh, Give me a couple weeks, yeah, and uh, you could come later. So what are you going to do? He said, I'll tell you later. What Ted did, he beat up everybody of the 15 people there, and he got, they all got, and they all left, but uh, Teddy would hit them, and they didn't like to be hit. And so he got rid of them, and then he would call Junior and say, hey, Junior, uh, is it Ron and one of the students and the two girls uh, are here, you could come teach us. Uh, why the two girls? Well, Kokori liked the two girls, so, you know, they're here when he comes. So that's how we got Junior, Wally, Okay, Romel, who joined us later on, Guy Kanan, and uh, so there was a total of six of us, and we got to train privately with uh, Kakoi, and you know, the girls left. And how we got started into uh, uh, doing for 18 straight years is that uh, uh, Kakoi would tell Junior, said, Junior, why don't you teach him uh, forms and, uh, you know, just the pattern. And uh, so Junior turned to Ted and said, hey, uh, he, you know, Kukoi wants to teach you the, the basic. And Ted said, no, tell Kukoi we want to learn how to fight. And that's how it turned into we were the fighters. And so we learned things that was not taught in Cebu. You know, and we learned how to fight. And Ted, and we had the background of we were boxers, kung fu guys, judo guys, akito guys. You know, And so we had the background. So what happened is that we really... Uh, we're pushing Kokoi because no one would push Kokoi out of respect. You know, we didn't know any better. You know, we would push Kokoi, but we want to see what he does. You know, and, and he would turn on. Ted would tell me that the first five moves of when he worked with uh, Kokoi, he would block him. And I said, Well, why five? He said, Well, after five, Kokoi would get mad, you know, and then figure out what you're doing. Then he start beating you up. You know, so, so that's Teddy, you know. So we were for 18 straight years and Kukoi would be uh, with us for six months and we'd pick him up, take him to my school and we would learn just to fight and he would say, you guys are the fighters, you know, if they really challenge you, you fight, you know, so that's how we learn. Well, it's interesting, you know, knowing that 
the background of Junior and Kelly. You can see the influence of how we influence Kukoi to help each other get better. And I know that the system of the, um, the screamer that is taught right now under the Kukoi flag is heavily influenced from the group from San Jose. And that's your group. Yeah, and uh, w the thing is that we, we came to the uh, realization that he was teaching us individually because all six of us were different. So he would teach us differently. You know, he was part of us. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is that I think you know, not only he was fine tuning us, but we were fine tuning him because we would give him uh, some feedback in the sense that you know we would challenge him. And we didn't know any better at that time. We just want to see what happens. Right. You know? So he does something we block. And then he takes off with the hits. Oh, okay. So that's how you do that. So that's how we learn. You know, I'm going to be jumping back and forth. But, you know, what comes to mind is you wrote a book. Can you talk, tell us more about your book? Well, you got Michael Parsman, who's on here too, and I have to appreciate him. Uh, the way the book came about uh, is called Life and Chi. Uh, and uh, Michael, you know, bless his heart. You know, we went to Norway and I was telling little stories, you know, about my background. And, and Michael said, uh, if you leave this planet, who's going to know, you know what you did or, or who you are? I said, oh, gee, I don't know. And so Michael said, well, why don't you write uh, little stories that you come to mind about your martial art and your life experience? And then uh, I'll put it together. And so it was two years in the making, uh, sent pictures. So it's an ebook form. And, uh, and recently, Michael just completed and uh, in translated into German. So I got English and German in ebook form. And uh, it's a kind of like a tell all story. My first black eye, how I got in with uh, Kung Fu and how I got into involvement with uh, Kukoi Kenyete and also uh, how I got into in the whips and how I'm working with the whips. Awesome, awesome. Now, let's get to your whip. Tell us yeah. about your, 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 your bull whip, because I know that um, a lot of people have been going to your seminars <laughs> and they've been whipping their own selves. Oh yeah, in fact, I gave you a whip. Yeah, yeah two of them, matter of fact. Yeah, so this this is a uh, uh, Joe Strain whip and uh, there's a little, little video clip on that. You know. But the way I got involved with that, I had a whip on my wall of the Kung Fu school and I hated it. It was like a cowhide. Cowhide is not very good uh, material. But it's on a swivel hook type of thing. Yeah. And you swivel it, and I hate it. And I had it on the wall. And so during you know, the seminar at Kokoi, uh, one of the members of uh, Kokoi Dosipata saw I uh, had a whip and said, You do whips. He said, I hate it. I don't like it. And it reminded me of, like a chain whip. No, I don't like it. And so he said, Well, I've been doing whip for 30 years. He said, uh, Here, let me give you a whip shorter and uh, you can work with that. So he taught me three moves. And he said, I'll come back you know, later on and I'll see what you, you could do with the three moves. And well, he came back later, about a couple months later. And so uh, I liked it. And so my style you know, became very fluid because I used my left hand. Because when I learned Kukoi style hooks, well, let's see, the and the left hand, it worked, worked together. So I chi background and Kung Fu background. So I created uh, my own style called uh, Tibetan Wave, which uh, he named as well. You like Tibetan meditation, energy stuff. So uh, uh, <clears throat> why don't we name it Tibetan Wave? So that's how that came up. And by the way, the, I gravitated from uh, the kangaroos. I have kangaroo, you know, Joe Strain, and I got a Peter Jackman. These are all leather kangaroo, which is very uh, highly tense uh, type of material, is really good. But I kind of gravitated to uh, uh, what we call Nanan Whip, made by Bobby Holy Oaks in Moab, Utah. And because of her, I created my style really, uh, which is a little clip on that, uh, how to use the left hand with it. Uh, and because she made the Nanan Whip, you know, to my specification, here's Bobby, beautiful Bobby. And here's all the whips that she makes, you know, fantastic. In two years, she became a top notch uh, whip maker. And uh, a lot of people know her, Peter Jack know her, uh, uh, Joe Strain know her and everything else. Uh, and because of her particular uh, style of making this, 
is able to translate of how I use this differently because uh, with other whips, you know, I can't do the things that we really want to do, you know, with my left hand until she made this. And, and uh, thankfully that she's doing this full time now. Uh, she used to be, be a uh, beauty salon, you know, uh, at, a, at a eight hour job, seven days a week type thing. And now she gravitates, she's only do part time uh, beauty salon and full time with this. And so she's a busy gal and uh, very top down. I highly rec recommend it. So anyone interested in getting to the, the whip class or learning the whip, where, where can they get the whip from? Uh, you can look on Bobby Holyoke's uh, website. Uh, just type in Bobby Holyoke. He's on Facebook. And uh, also I've got Mike, Michael Parsman. He's in Germany and uh, he's my uh, uh, go-to guy in Germany. In fact, he's my first certified uh, whip instructor in Germany. And we have a website on there and, uh, and Michael's propagating the Tibetan wave uh, in Germany and uh, have seminars. So every time I go back to seminar, we do have a seminar on, on the uh, Tibetan wave whips. In fact, <clears throat> they're getting a pretty good following in Germany. And uh, uh, on that note, on that note, Sifu Ron, just to let everybody know that Sifu Ron will actually be having another website where you guys can join in. He's going to have a subscription website where you can learn how to use the whip. So uh, that will actually be given to you guys uh, within the next two weeks. I think it's going to be launched. So if you guys get a chance, uh, either message me or Sifu Ron Lu about it because he will actually have the actual program on how to learn the whip. Again, back to you, Sifu Ron. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the plug. I appreciate that. Yeah, with that would be in the works for almost uh, a year, a year and a half. So that's good. Uh, so I know I got to get back to the story. See for a while. The, uh, the time that uh, went to Hamburg, Germany, uh, I we were staying at the red light district, you know, uh, Ripplebond area. And uh, I had an interest. I said, wow, you know, in this area, they have bull whips, you know, and uh, especially, you know, in the uh, sex area type of thing. So we went downstairs and I figured that's where your school was, I think, down there. So I went downstairs and I saw beautiful black, red whip with spikes. And I said to myself, I said, man, that must really hurt. Well, this beautiful blonde German gal nudged me and I said, that does hurt. And I said, oh, okay, uh, that, that's not for me. I'm not going to work with that one, you know. But anyway, the uh, there's the whips is kind of interesting that uh, most of the uh, people who are practicing professionally and uh, so this uh, amateur doing that they they work with the cracking of uh, exactness and accuracy and flipping and throwing and everything, but no one and uh, is using the whip with the left hand, and I found I said wow that's kind of strange you know I like the left hand, so that's why I developed the style of the Tibetan wave is working with the left hand. No one is really using the left hand with the whip. So uh, so that's a, a different style to it. Yeah, so, you know, you folks, if you want to learn that, you know, we'll have this on the website. And also I have uh, uh, Daniel Trout, uh, who's uh, filming, and we did a DVD on this, uh, of a lesson how to do the Tibetan wave. So that's, that's uh, available too through uh, Bobby Holyoaks. And uh, so soon we'll have that. In fact, on our website that Sonny was talking about, you know, we're going to have that available too. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, as you can see, there's not, the martial arts are not just limited to just kicking and punches. You learn the different types of weapons and there's, and actually, I would say exo exotic type of weapon, not traditionally within the Chinese system, but this is something that you created yourself so genuinely you are the master of your trade. Okay, um, what's, uh, I, you know, we've been together a while and you know, I get on my ukulele and you get on your musical instrument. Tell us more about how you become the master of the harmonica. Well, I wouldn't say a master, this is a learning process, still taking lessons from uh, David Barrett and I have two instructor, uh, David Barrett, who's very, uh, he's very well known. Uh, professionally in, in, uh, in performance, actually instructor, you know. And 
this was my first time <coughs> actually bringing my harmonica to uh, the Back of the Roots. Remember we went to Back of the Roots? And I had my harmonica with me and uh, one of the members of uh, uh, Kaji Kempo, who plays the trombone, mm -hmm. invited me to be on stage uh, at Mickey G uh, in Honolulu. And he had a, a little group that he played with all the time. And so he called me on stage and uh, uh, I played the harp. You know, and never had lessons that time. And so I got, got hook. He said, man, I really like, I like the harmonica. Well, the reason why I came up with the harmonica is that uh, yeah, I like the a, a flat. The reason why I came up with that is that after my wife passed away, you know, about over 11 years ago, I had to learn how to breathe again. <laughs> the only instrument that you could breathe Inhaling and you can breathe, exhaling is the harmonica. And so that's why I took up this, is to refocus myself, but also learn how to breathe. Uh, but also, you mentioned last time you had an interview with Chad about, uh, do you take any instrument? You and Kokori said the same thing to me, you know, one time. They said, uh, uh, to be a master, this is what comes from Kokori says, in order to be a master, a true master, you need to take up music either sing, play an instrument, because it's rhythm, you know. And I know you always say that jazz, you love jazz, okay? And that's part of, the, of uh, your style is learning to do the buzz saw and do the jazz type of thing. And because you're really working with syncopation, you're working with the, uh, between the half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes. And the interesting thing, after you said that to me, I started thinking, so, you know, this is what Kokoi does, you know? He does the syncopation of rhythm and the half beat, quarter beats, and eighth with the screamer sticks. He does that. And uh, about over the uh, last two years, I've been working with uh, uh, Grandmaster uh, Ernie Reyes Sr. And uh, he called me up, said, you know, and through Dan uh, Haley from uh, Beamerton, you know, he's actually one of his, uh, uh, his students and been teaching also learning uh, those products. And so he got uh, Ernie Reyes interested, you know, to teach you know, that to them, but also learn that from him. So I got a call from Ernie Reyes. He said, uh, can you, <coughs> there's Ernie, bless his heart. So he called, gave me a call and said, hey, uh, I, I got an interest of one of my students want to learn uh, Kokoi Dose Parasta. Can you do that? You know, Dave Moderna. And... And he said, yeah, I, I could teach that to him. He said, but it'd be better if you have two students. So he sent me two students, you know, Daniel and also David. And then uh, Ernie said, before he hung up, that, do you mind if I uh, come and watch sometimes of you teaching them? I said, sure, yeah. So I go to the school and uh, Ernie never left. Yeah, we taught, you know, and of course we can't teach now, but we teach every Friday and Ernie was there. And he was learning, you know, Dospot. He has 40 schools, 4,000 students. Awesome. Okay. And he's integrating this in his curriculum of the Kokoi Dospot style. Yeah. And uh, before we stopped teaching, you know, at uh, his school, he said, you know, Ron, I said, I've been learning the Eskrima Kokoi style from you. My hands got faster. I said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because when you have an object in your hand, and, and then when you don't have an object in the hand, you know, it becomes much, much faster. So uh, uh, that's how I came about working with that. Hmm. Play us a tune. Yeah. Play us a tune. You, you think I got my harmonica here? You got your guitar here? In the beginning of the show, you just showed me your harmonica. You know, when we go uh, teaching a seminar in Germany, you know, and we come back, you know, one o'clock in the morning, and here we're here we're under our uh, undies, ready to go to bed, and you take out your ukulele, and I take out my harmonica, one o'clock in the morning. I'm surprised we're not kicked out of there. Yeah, yeah I'll play something for you. Yeah. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. 
That's great. That's great. <laughs> well, you know, music plays a very important part in the martial arts because of its rhythm. You know, we recommend that any of you that is in the martial arts learn some kind of musical instrument because you begin to learn your beats, your half beats, and all of that is really, really important. We're coming to a close right now. And uh, before we even close, I want to say thank you. But Ron, what is your greatest joy? And what kind of inspirational words could you leave our audience with? Well, I I met this young lady uh, at the camp in uh, in Germany because I usually go to the outdoor camps, uh, the one half good door. And I really enjoy teaching uh, the uh, second, third, and fourth generation over there. Uh, I think the one thing that, uh, that in my mind, inspirational is by my wife. Uh, she had uh, stage four cancer. And uh, on the passing days, you know, just the last couple of days before she passed, she said to me, she said, I'm sorry that I was stupid because she was a smoker. Yeah, for over 30 years. She quit for a while when we had our uh, uh, Janine, but then she took smoking again. Uh, but she said to me, she, you know, I was really stupid. Well, I met this young lady and I was doing my whip type of thing. And then uh, I always joke, said, Is that, does anybody here smoke? You know, because I had my whip in my hand. I said, you know, take the whip out, you know, with a smoker. And everybody pointed to this beautiful young lady. And they all pointed to her. And uh, on closing, uh, when we start packing up, you know, I took her aside. We did a little walk, and I told her the story. I said, uh, "You're smoke. You're very young. You know, you need to quit." And this is what my wife said to me. I said, "I'm very stupid. I should have never done that." And I saw her, you know, a year later you know, at the camp, and she came up to me, you know, gave me a hug. I said, I quit smoking. I said, wow. I said, if you didn't say anything to me, I wouldn't have done that. So to me, that, that was very uh, you know, touching. And I could pass that on to anybody. I said, if you're a smoker, you know, quit you know, and uh, save your life. Absolutely. You know, we've had fun talking to you, Ron. And I sure would like to have you again in the future on the show um this you've been very inspirational to a lot of people and i thank you for that your book i want to talk about your book again where can people get your book where can they get your whip well the book is on email you can go to amazon uh, prime and you can order through there um and it's also, you know, you, you have the queue and the, whether you want English or German, because now it's in both. Yeah, so you could order from there. The whip, uh, you could order through uh, Bobby Holy Oaks. Uh, you, and she's on Facebook. And you could type in, you type in uh, Holy Oaks uh, Nylon Whip. Uh, she's on there. And she's in uh, Moet, Utah. And uh, she's a busy gal. I mean, she's got like a, a, a over. Uh, Past setting out uh, with for over about six months. She's just really inundated because she makes all kinds of different ways. So you could get through her and uh, click on, uh, on Google or Amazon.com, you know, holyoaks.com, and she's there. Beautiful lady. Uh, we try to get together a bunch of year. And Great. I also hook up with, uh, oh, by the way, Anthony Delange, say hello to you. So Anthony is also a professional. You know, right. But, well, we're supposed to get together sometime this year and, and do some things. That, but uh, he took a liking to me. I took a liking to him because we, we do Comic Con you know, for about the last two years. And we're going to do some things with whips. And, yeah, I first met him. I first met him when we were doing the movie Jaguar Live in Spain. This was back in 1979. And ever since then, you know, we've been in contact here and there, actually, to my son, Mark. You know, um, that's, that's great. I'm going to turn it over to Sonny right now. Uh, Sonny got some words that uh, he'd like to bring up before we actually close. Sonny? Thank you, Sifu. Again, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you 
you got some gold nuggets, I would recommend you watch the replay on YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please do subscribe. Hit the like button. Hit that bell icon so that this way you'll get notified when you when the next video or next thing that Sifu Al puts out. Also, don't forget that he does have his book out, Legacy. Make sure uh, check it out on Amazon. It's there for sale, mm -hmm. as well as we've got other things coming up. He's got a lot of big projects. Again, just a reminder, go to the CoscosMartialArt.com so that this way you can either A, get started with some of his training with his DTS as well as his One Hub Can Do old videos. And he will actually having all the new programs upcoming soon enough. So again, thank you everyone for joining in. Thank you Sifu Ron for sharing us your stories. Love your whips, love your book. Uh, if you guys are also interested, he will actually have that program up and running soon enough. So again, thank you everyone. So if everybody wants to unmute yourselves, you're hey. more than welcome to say hi. Oh, sorry, before you unmute yourself, Sifu Al has something to say. Go ahead, Sifu Al. Okay, next week on the 20, April yeah. 24th, sorry. we've got, we've got Chung Lee coming up. Yes, we Chung Lee is going to be next weekend on the 24th, and then we have on May 1st, Saturday, we have Sunny Sison, yeah. he's a white choreographer. Uh, he's now in the Philippines, but actually, he's doing a lot of movies there. And on May 8th, we have Malia de Cosmo Brunel, and on May 22nd, we have Art Camacho, and then June 5th, we have Mike Mathers. I have a whole list of people that's going to be coming on throughout the throughout the years but right now just bear in mind that we have this four awesome people that's going to be coming up within this next month again i repeat to you may 1st is going to be sunny sison may 8th is going to be malia de, uh, de casca Brunel, on may 22nd art camacho and then on june 5th mike mathers so um, we're going to be sending out information and hopefully you folks get into what we're doing because these people are not where they are today without having good motivation within themselves to go. And from what we had had so far with all the other people and including those that's gonna be on, there's gonna be a lot of golden nuggets coming up. So that said, Sonny, I, I think you're gonna end this with clicking on everybody so we can actually uh, say hasta la vista until the next time. Sonny? Can everybody say hello to Sifu Ron? And well, well, let's and fact, let's say thank, thank you. you. Hello. Let's give, a, let's give a good clap to. Oh. Thank you. Let's go. Just give them a good clap right there. Fantastic. Wow. Ron, Ron, I appreciate it. You've done really good. I know that we went through a lot of things this last 50 years, and hopefully we have another 50 years more. <laughs> yep. And uh, maybe the next time I, I'll, I'll have a more purpose to be wearing my hat. Yeah. But not yet. <laughs> Okay, so let's, it, at, at that said, um, guys, we're going to close out and wish everybody a great weekend, be a safe weekend, and how you handle the pandemic is really going to be up to you. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Ron, see ya. You take care. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you for uh, folks uh, joining in, especially in Germany. You folks are really up late. I see you. You're going sleeping now. Right. Even Chris and Wolf is still staying up. He should be asleep right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in, my, in my bed right now. Krishna, yeah. you have to wear a hat. <laughs> but I appreciate for you folks that are joining in uh, and uh, sharing my story. And Sifu, uh, it's been 55 years we know each other. 55 years. Ron, we'll get together soon for some prawns. Oh, oh sure. I, I said we'd get together, and now we can soon. So I'll look forward to that. I'll give you a call. Okay, you take care. Uh, Thank right. you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a great weekend. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.
Take care. Nobody wants to get off. It and was my mission. Oh, you weekend. Bye-bye. Barney, you can keep my jacket now. You still got my jacket? Yeah, yeah, I still keep it. Oh, don't wear it now. Don't get it dirty. <laughs> I wash it almost every week. Yeah, next year. Okay. We'll get another hat, too. <laughs> <laughs>